Oh, here we go. <laughs> So I'm the co-founder of a design and innovation studio here in Los Angeles called Collective Future. And at our studio, we use different kinds of strategies for helping our clients imagine what's possible in the future. Uh, storytelling and, um, and thinking about future context is a really big part of what we do. And we also say that we go, like to go into the future and then come back to today to create the road, to develop the roadmaps to create the futures that have been envisioned. Um, I've also been one of the co-organizers of Speculative Futures LA, so it's a startup. Travis mentioned earlier that there are, uh, there's a larger organization, a, a, a larger nonprofit that we're a part of. And I think as of right now, there's something like 47 chapters globally, which is pretty amazing. So there's many, many other people out there who are thinking about and talking about um, similar things. So we're the LA chapter. And we're starting this series on really creating and developing futures literacy. There's been so many conversations and questions around the, you know, about the relevance of these kinds of practices today. And so, you know, we thought we would start to put together this series because there's so many interesting ways in which people are practicing them. And so that's a really big part of what we're going to be focusing on is really looking at how to make these practices really relevant, uh, not actually, they are relevant, but really um, to talk about how we can make them more present and accessible to different kinds of audiences. So with that, our first, um, our first guest is Dave Rosell, and Dave actually is going to become one of the organizers as well. So it's very apt that he's doing this presentation, and he's going to be speaking about um, strategic foresight. So with that, Dave, I'll let you introduce yourself and, and take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Give me one second. Okay. Um, great. So thank you, everyone, first of all, for being here today. Um, very excited to be able to talk about strategic foresight. Um, really happy to be able to get to share it, too, in this context with Speculative Futures LA. Um, I know we're in kind of the uh, surreal time these days with uh, dealing with a global pandemic and many of the other factors that are co happening and coinciding. Um, but, you know, grateful that we have tools to be able to convene um, in spite of that. And what I, what I hope is that some of the tools talking about today, um, we will be able to actually think um, even more critically about what, what, we, what we can do and have agency in this time. So um, Ronnie asked me a couple of months ago to just kind of give a little bit of an overview on what strategic foresight is. Um, so decided to be super happy to do that. So today what um, we'll be covering is going to give over an overview on just really what the definition of strategic foresight is. Um, I've been understanding that a lot of people uh, probably aren't exactly sure what it is. Um, and throughout this presentation, we'll be really looking at this from the design perspective. And I'll elaborate that in a moment. Going to be also be looking at organizational applications. So how does this really work within a firm? I think that's one of the big questions that I'm really hoping to get into today. Uh, I want to just touch on its ontology by giving a kind of a brief history of where foresight comes from and how it's evolving and merging into other practices today. Um, do an overview of foresight tools. Um, foresight's very tools heavy. Um, so I want to give a little bit of a review on what those are. And then I just want to close with explaining a little bit more about how I personally practice foresight. Um, and then we'll turn it open to Q&A. And we've already gotten some um, questions. Um, so very, very thoughtful questions. So we can hit those and then any new questions that come up. Great. So just a quick little intro on who I am. So uh, you guys know that. Um, <clears throat> as I said, uh, my name is Dave Roselli, and um, I have kind of had a varied way of coming into this work. Um, I currently work for BCG Digital, Digital Ventures. This is a company where uh, we basically are at the intersection of venture capital, consulting, and technology. And we build, uh, we invent and build and invest in new technology builds. And in this company, I act as a, I'm a strategic designer and I, I kind of wear a few different hats. Um, so I can be on the strategic foresight, which is um, a little bit more on the conceptual future visioning element, which I'll elaborate on. 
um, innovation strategy, which is helping companies identify new products, services, or experiences to build. And then on the uh, build side, where I act as more of a UX designer. Um, and so I've gotten to work on a handful of projects to date, um, spent about a little over a year working on a computer vision based industrial safety product that was uh, launched in Korea. And the, basically we were able to um, anticipate for uh, dangerous behavior before it happened and we're, or could intervene. And then also working on a new applied futurist model uh, for a workshop so that we can take corporate um, clients and walk them through uh, like a, a week, basically a week long workshop to help them identify and imagine new future opportunities. Um, I also uh, am in my little bit of free time that I have, I'm a director of projects and um, operations for uh, a nonprofit in architecture. This group is called Open Architecture Collaborative. And um, our purpose is to uh, basically identify, connect and maximize design potential for underserved communities in LA. Um, and so in my role, I'm actually kind of managing our pro bono volunteers and working with community members. Uh, and we kind of have a sweet spot in community centers in LA. Um, and this kind of, I think is a good snapshot of like where my intersections lie of kind of the more formal parts in the, the corporate sector and, and wanting to build new technologies, but then also being with people in kind of more of a grassroots scenario and taps into my background in architecture and uh, sociology. And so I'll elaborate over time just how uh, kind of I came into this foresight path. So this is a, a popular kind of diagram that's gone around or uh, that comes from Elliot Montgomery um, out of Parsons. I, I find myself often thinking about this diagram because um, design is a pretty kind of tricky field sometimes when you're in it. Um, I started off in architectural design and it's basically been in design now for over 10 years. And it's sometimes very blurry and ambiguous on where things start and stop. And so I really love this axis that um, this, this basically map is structured on, where on the left we have constrained, kind of more of a constrained process, and on the right is unconstrained. And so you see in the two kind of poles, we have strategy and art. And then within them, and you see kind of all these different overlaying uh, circles, is that we start to see the different sub-disciplines of design and, um, and different types of design. Just, so just to kind of read a couple, of, uh, go through them kind of quickly, we have you know, a big one in the middle that bridges strategy and art, which is design. That's a process probably many of us are familiar with. It has a bit more of a traditional side to it. It could be analog design. It's now also translating into digital design. A lot of design is really uh, predicated upon the process by which it's created. So there's a really specific design process. And then um, we have some we have also speculative design, which is more of a nuanced part of really getting to imagine, uh, you know, more open ended, less constrained uh, new design applications. Where we have some more uh, angles in the, the future space is around future studies and design futures. Um, future studies is an interesting element because this actually connects also with a lot of humanities and social science. Um, so uh, Jim, Dr. Jim Dater out of University of Hawaii really put future studies on the map about 30 years ago, um, which was really or organized through a grant between the US government and um, Hawaii, and really be, was able to formalize the study of the future. Um, and what I wanted to kind of really play with this is kind of add a little adaptation of where I believe strategic foresight lives in this, this uh, mix. I, I would argue that foresight is kind of overlaying very much on the strategy side, and, um, but I think it touches upon um, future studies, uh, speculative design, design overall, design thinking, which I think many of us are familiar with, um, and design futures. It's basically living at this intersection. But what I, what I understand is that from a designer's perspective, um, a lot of us were not really exposed to strategic foresight. Um, and what I want to share is kind of getting into the reasons why and where, where foresight really comes from and it's why it's kind of been a little hidden from just from the kind of average person to be able to uh, identify and find it. Um, so kind of the, throughout this presentation, I want to kind of make the case for why I believe foresight is in this place and how over time I believe foresight is going to become an increasingly more design centric field. Um, wouldn't be a good 
foresight presentation without an Einstein quote, um, but I, I think there's some real gems that he um, he's put out. So he says that we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we use to create them. Um, and speculative design and strategic foresight is a tool that really can help fill this void and come up with solutions to an uncertain future. Um, I believe we're kind of entering really the era of paradigms where we now are going to start to understand the paradigm of the pro a problem sits within. And if we're starting to attack a problem with the same paradigm that it was birthed in, we'll only really see incremental change. And I think many of us are really desiring to see that next level, bigger transformative change. So that we're not seeing just these kind of trickle down, small little changes in, in, our, in our work or in our, in our reality. So to give a formal definition of what strategic foresight is, it's the ability to create and maintain a high quality, coherent and functional forward view of the future and to apply the insights arising in organizationally useful ways. So for example, to detect adverse conditions, guide policy, shape strategy, to explore new markets, products, and services. It represents a futures methods with those of strategic management. And this is by Richard Slaughter. Um, and I think what's really key here is how foresight is centered on the organization. Um, that's where I think it really differs from some of the other design practices is that it has to be very thoughtful in the way that it's gonna enter the organization. Where foresight's gonna get a lot of value is being able to communicate with other people in the organization. And so in order to do that, you're, in foresight, you actually have to come onto other people's terms to a degree in the sense of being able to find shared language shared understanding of processes, uh, shared understanding of, frankly, how the work is getting done. That type of trust is, I think, really critical for successful foresight. And some of the key principles here is that foresight is, is about anticipating, not predicting. Um, and, you know, the, what we see on the right is the futures cone. This is a very popular diagram. And what, what the futures cone is really getting at is that when we start to look into the future, what we're gonna really see is a diversity of futures. There's not just one option. We're not gonna just be able to look to the, from the past and be able to project out into the future. We're really gonna be able to see an alternative set of futures. But how do you do that? How do you actually get these alternative set of futures? That's where Foresight's really introducing a pretty sophisticated set of methods to be diligent about understanding how to really construct and create containers for these different futures. Also, foresight really is different from strategic, kind of traditional strategic planning because um, it doesn't rely on presumptions about the future. Instead, it's, it's constantly taking new signals in. So there's a term called sense making where you're, you're really, frankly, trying to make sense of the world around you. And so that's taking in new inputs like trends, weak signals, wild cards, and being able to synthesize those to really say like, okay, what does this mean for my understanding of the way the world's going? And where this kind of works in its best is it's the goal is trying to really help organizations strive towards their preferred future. So how can we as foresight professionals actually help leadership teams really become the organization that they want to be and understand how can they reach their customers the best, be competitive in the market, and be relevant with the macro trends that are happening in the world. Another huge part is really being able to codify foresight um, into a series of steps. Um, so Dr. Andy Hines is a, a great uh, futurist out of the University of Houston's program. And he has a book um, called Thinking About the Future. And in, inside of that book is, are very methodical steps of how to run a foresight process or like a foresight sprint. Um, he walks you through six steps. And at a high level, those can be broken up into strategy and action. So I'm just gonna read through these pretty quickly. Um, first step is all about framing. Um, it's all about really understanding what is it that we're actually trying to understand about the future. This kind of has some similar kind of uh, relationships to design thinking and wanting to really kind of define the problem that we're trying to solve for. Here, it's not so much just the problem, but it's wanting to understand really what's the focal issue, what's the bigger topic. Once you have that established, and let's say we're talking about the intersection of tech and agriculture, you know, now we want to start to think about what, what we want to start to scan. So now we want to see what, what are all the signals that are happening on the periphery that are starting to really going to inform the way our understanding of the way that the industry is starting to change. Um, I find this to be a very exciting part of the process because it feels a lot more fresh. 
We're not using cliches. We're not using kind of dated material. We're really getting to extract kind of potent information to inform our thinking and strategy. Next, we then go into the futuring stage. So this is now when we're starting to really imagine new futures. And so this can be done through using two by twos, scenarios. Um, basically, we're now gonna project uh, a future vision um, and off of some type of time horizon to really think what could happen in, in the future. And that serves as like a simulative space. And I think that's where there's a lot of cre creativity that happens. And you can do a lot of analysis in that space. Um, and through that analysis, you get into the next set of steps and that's where the action occurs. So now once we have kind of this, uh, we've already been able to identify our focal issue, we've figured out some scanning, we've, we've created a future vision, we now have something to really anchor on about what we wanna tell our leaders about what we should do. And that's when we get into visioning. And so this is gonna really align all the leaders in the organization or whoever the scope of work is really centered on to agree upon, you know, this is the direction we wanna go. And once you're at that stage, you now can get into the more of the mechanics of what are we gonna design? What are we gonna actually go build? And then the next step of adapting, this is actually going out to put it into the world. Um, so I find this exciting because it, it's not something that's just gonna sit on a bookcase, right? This should really be something that activates forward movement into act doing something and ideally changing things in your organization. So what are some of the benefits? Um, the benefits are, you know, at a high level, this provides mental scaffolding to the team to really uncover and confront cognitive biases that distort our view of the future. I actually think this is a gigantic point. This can get overlooked, but this is the invisible, subtle parts of design that I think we all know when we've been in the room, when someone is talking and they're, they're not aware of their own biases, but they're feeling so confident and they wanna push forward with an idea and you feel like you're stuck. Like there's nothing really helping to open up that person's perspective. What, I, what Foresight is doing is it's creating uh, this term mental scaffolding is just really allowing you to go into more cognitive, uh, more sophisticated cognitive states to have conversations that really help open people's minds. And, that, and that's very abstract and I know that's a little hard to kind of ground, but frankly design is kind of lives in this space. We're all you know, professional designers are kind of living in this world of mental scaffolding. We all have our processes of helping us get to these conclusions and insights about how we want to solve something. So this is a very kind of structured and formulaic way to do that. I'll just hit these other points kind of quick. But um, the other thing is that we can, we can solve for the faster source issue. You know, the famous thing with Henry Ford, if, you know, you ask the average person in the early 1900s what they would have wanted, they would have said that they would want a faster horse. And so the problem is that people often aren't always the best source of information about what the bigger future is going to be. Sometimes we get too much of a static understanding of solving for just the present day. Um, so foresight allows us to anticipate leaps and discontinuities where, we, where something actually kind of leapfrogs into a new um, paradigm, which I think is very exciting. Um, Within the organization, there's more awareness on what's actually happening in the world. There's more relevant conversations happening. That's critical. Culture is a huge part of this. There, there will be early warnings to start to see, oh, could this potential future actually start to happen? Did this signal just go off? Does that mean there's actually some indication that this new future is coming? You get to be a lot more alert, and you get to point things out, and you have evidence to really back that up. And then lastly, this also creates future-proof plans and decision-making. So now we can really empower resiliency to, the, to your decisions. And so that when you want to have the confidence to roll out a new product or design, you, you feel more assured that you've thought through how it could react to uncertainty. And I think that's another very dynamic part of this. So kind of shifting into this topic of why is it hard to talk about future at work? This is a question I think about quite a bit. A lot of it goes into management science and, and practices in the 20th century, really late 20th century. So deductive reasoning is a very kind of popular technique for how decision making is made in, in corporate America. Um, and for a while, it was probably fine to do because life had a level of predictability to it. What, what deductive reasoning really does is it's able to take data from you know, historical data from the last five years, 10 years, understand what are the key insights that came out of that data and extrapolate it and project it into the future. Um, and so, and for the most part, that, that can really work. But the problem is, is when we're in, you know, increasingly 
uncertain times, that becomes a lot more challenging, which I'll get to in a second. And you can see here on the right, you know, what, what, what also kind of uh, corporate strategic planning does is it stays a little bit on the surface. It doesn't also always go to root cause issues. It's not going to probably identify that deeper issue that will create systemic change. So it can stay a little bit more on the top level and just kind of keeping the ship going steady rather than kind of really elevating it to another level. Another element here is uh, certainty bias. Um, we love certainty. <laughs> certainty helps us minimize fear. Um, if you ever have been in a situation where we don't, you don't know what's going on, you know, there's some anxiety in the room with a group of people and there's someone that steps up confidently and says, we're gonna do this, we're gonna leave, you know, we're gonna go, uh, you know, if you've ever been traveling and you've gone the wrong way, you, you have someone deciding that we're gonna go a certain direction. That, that takes a lot of tension away. And so certainty becomes a, a very kind of um, desired thing to seek after for, and, and leaders really are gonna do everything they can to find that certainty so they can feel like they have authority in their organizations. But there is a flip side to this because, you know, there's risk of, of deductive reasoning. Um, you know, this was an article that was from 2007 with Nokia, where the headline here is that one billion customers, can anyone catch the cell phone king? And this is holding a phone that we don't use anymore. <laughs> this is where the, the belief of the strategic plan and the strategic vision was so confident that it was, so rigid, it was too rigid that it missed what the market was really saying. There was a lack of understanding customer behavior. There was in, they were investing in raw elements of the product and service. And frankly, they lose competitive advantage because they, they couldn't see what was coming. We now kind of know due to the pandemic that we, um, you know, there's basically been an acceleration in factors moving us into an even more volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. Um, this term is pretty important for uh, kind of the framing of futures literacy, uh, VUCA. It's a term that's kind of getting a lot more popularized throughout corporate America. It, it has history in the military. And basically it's a practical code for awareness and readiness for organizations across sectors asking, how much do you know about the situation and how well can you predict the results of your actions? Um, a VUCA reality disrupts conventional planning because of the inability to predict effectively because we don't have the right information. I think we can all take a step back and realize like we're very much kind of living through this place, th this phenomena right now. It's, it's very hard to plan just at all. I mean, even planning out a month or two. Um, I think this is really kind of encapsulates what kind of a VUCA reality looks like. So if we kind of continue on with deductive reasoning in a VUCA reality, what happens is we'll get a lot of reactionary thinking and reactionary thinking will dominate but we'll find out that it's really not going to drive success. Um, the, this will really start to speak to a, a need for uh, new boxes and to start really thinking more forward about what, what really opportunities do we have. So what strategic foresight will do is it finds relevance amidst uncertainty. And so where, what, the way that I believe that foresight and design can really interact is that foresight and design allows us to um, treat uncertainty like a variable that we are designing against. So we're basically building up a tool that's called uncertainty driven innovation. So where you're actually able to reframe a lot of the risk and challenges that are upcoming and see um, what will be second tertiary implications that could be actually things we start to solve for. And uh, that's a big part of the, this kind of shift from reactive to proactive that, that foresight really drives home. So I just want to touch quickly through just a little bit of more of the history on foresight, um, just because I think it gives a bit more ontology to explain kind of the culture of foresight. It has a particular vibe to it, and it's not, it's not from the design world. Um, foresight actually comes from the military. Um, so it was a tool that was developed in the late 1950s with the RAND Corporation. Um, RAND is actually in Los Angeles. It's in Santa Monica. You might have seen this building. And Herman Kahn is kind of credited as the founder. And RAND actually stands for Re Research and Development. So this was the Research and Development Wing of the Air Force. And they were basically tasked with thinking, basically thinking the unthinkable. So uh, that's a book that Herman Kahn wrote 
which was about anticipating a very uh, difficult subject of understanding kind of potential of nuclear war. And so this was at the beginning of the 60s where the Cold War, Cold war was pressing on and there was a lot of un unknowns about what could happen. And what his work did was allowed us collectively to simulate potential future situations, uh, which was somewhat of a breakthrough. And what I find interesting is part of his secret sauce was that uh, he was in LA and he connected with writers who were writing in Hollywood. And it was a writer in Hollywood who actually helped him come up with the term of scenario. Um, I think living in LA, I think I have a little appreciation for that because I think there's a, a huge parallel between foresight and storytelling that kind of gets a little under wrecked sometimes, but can be a really incredible part of this. And I think that's actually um, even something that could have more development. There could even be more partnership with foresight and storytellers and writers. But so Herman Kahn kind of puts scenarios on the map and then, you know, eventually they, they, it kind of um, uh, came, into, came into the corporate world. Uh, so this came into the corporate world at Shell, uh, oil and gas. Um, and it came through a guy named Pierre Walk. And um, he has a pretty incredible claim to fame because he helped them anticipate the oil crash. Um, so he was like three steps ahead of everyone else. And what he did that was so effective was that he was not only able to create a systematic scenario model, but he was able to create alignment with all organizational leadership. And so he was able to actually help influence corporate strategy. Um, and I think that's a really key point of understanding foresight is that people who are interested in the future tend to be people at the top, people at the top of an organization. And so if you want to really think about, you know, how do we have impact? How do we push this, push these kind of new ideas forward? You have to realize we have to engage with that type of hierarchy within the organization. And that's what I think Pierre Wach did um, super well. And I think he's a, kind of a quirky guy. He's kind of described as a, he's always described as either unconventional or like a, a mystic or someone who didn't really fit in with the kind of status quo. And I think that's, there's some, some dynamic relationship there. Um, and also he has a great collection of essays and articles to explain these tools on Harvard Business Review. So super recommend uh, looking at those. I think there's one called uh, Living, The Living Waters. That's a very good, very good article. Moving into the 90s um, and what I think a lot of even present day has been informed by is, is Global Business Network, GBN. Um, this was founded by uh, many um, foresight practitioners from Shell. And um, this includes Stuart Brand, Peter Schwartz, Lawrence Wilkinson, Napier Collins, and James Ogilvy. Uh, many of these men, <laughs> it's kind of been a male dominated world at this point, um, it, they, they went on to be really influential in terms of helping organizations take a stake in the future. Um, Stuart Brand, I think, is very influential with the whole Earth Catalog. So he, you know, has some credit for really helping awaken an environmental consciousness. Um, Peter Schwartz is a very well-respected consultant in corporate America for helping um, think about the future. I actually learned one of the partners at my company was on a project with Peter Schwartz um, some years ago, and this was in the early 90s, and he talks about it as if it was a couple weeks ago, because he was so stimulated by the way Peter Schwartz was able to activate futures. And they went so far that they made it experiential. Like people were having to drive around golf carts, literally in different sets, to imagine these different worlds. Um, and so they, they really pushed boundaries of not only being able to think about the future, but how to communicate what that future could look like. Um, and then when it gets to the 90s, I think, you know, I think that a lot of uh, um, kind of smaller companies, different companies emerged. And I'll be honest, I think my, my understanding of really kind of the, the continuity gets a little fuzzy. But it, I know that there, a big part of what happens in the early 2000s is that there starts to be organizations that form. So you have like World's Future Society, Association of Professional Futurists. Um, so now the, the term futurists is becoming a little bit more popular. And there's communities and professional um, associations that are forming to help strengthen this kind of burgeoning industry. Um, and, and every culture that you apply foresight or futurism to is going to have its own adaptation. So if you're applying it to the private sector, it's going to look very different than the public sector, then it would look for academia, nonprofits. 
So there becomes some like subspecialties, subspecialization that happens. But what, what that means is you can get a little lonely, you can get a little locked in to your little domain that these types of organizations really help become a little bit more expansive. Just want to hit in a couple other uh, points um, just to make this a little bit more broad. So there's other influences with strategic foresight. Long Now Foundation is a really fascinating foundation that's from Stuart Brand. Uh, he's kind of coined the 10,000 year clock. Um, so he'll, you might even see um, a year, like time written in five digits. So we would be in zero 2020. And his whole kind of big part of his work is really pushing our thinking to be just to challenge our time horizons completely. Like even thinking 100 years is, is too small. He, he wants us to think in the dimensions of 10,000 years. And what could we accomplish by understanding that scale? Then we also have Afrofuturism. So this was a term that was coined in the early 90s um, by Mark Derry. And this is really centered on connecting black history and culture to technology and future visions. Um, and there's a lot of themes around uh, liberation and, and post-colonialism and um, imagining a future where, you know, there, there's safety in this culture compared to the, the world and history for uh, Black diaspora around the world. Um, project Drawdown is a famous project uh, that's um, focused on ecological futures. This is taking a very focused effort on understanding the risks that climate change are yielding on, on Earth. And they're providing, I think it's over a hundred different examples of very tactical, tangible technologies that we could be building today to help mitigate the consequences that can come from climate change. Um, and some of this is inspired with the Biomimicry Institute, um, focusing um, also on Green New Deal. Um, it's really some amazing work. And then also we're seeing this kind of trend now with like the corporate innovation lab, but really centered on the moonshot. So Google, I think, is kind of really, you know, put things on the map with X and uh, they have a lot of really kind of, I think, pretty actually fascinating projects. So this is Project Loon. Um, they just released yesterday that they're um, deploying this over Mozambique. And this kind of supports the bigger vision that they want the globe to be connected digitally. Um, and I think this kind of speaks to a trend that we're seeing around corporations and futures technology trying to solve for bigger systemic issues. Um, so just wanted to revisit this, you know, this graph to see just, you know, again, where we are on the constrained versus unconstrained and just reiterate that where, what, again, this is really centered on, I would say is the organization. So now we can start to think about how is the organization performing its mission and vision. And uh, other elements of foresight can also get into uh, governance design and organizational design, where you, we can now actually start moving the levers that control organizations to really be more effective in executing the overall goals of, of the company. And I think sometimes design really can struggle with having influence in the organization. I think there are some issues around perception, around the value proposition that designers yield. Uh, I think we can get kind of boxed in quite a bit about what we really are capable of doing. I think there's still a hyper materialism kind of focus around what's the thing you're making. And there's less awareness on the importance of designing the invisible. Um, but I believe we're, we're really at this kind of shift where the invisible is gonna become much, much more important. Um, as we, we solve for more of these wicked complex problems. So I wanna now just dive into an overview of the, the tools. I have my image of scaffolding, let's try to reiterate that point of uh, what these tools are doing. And so this is just a high level on the tools and I'd be happy to kind of do a deeper dive on this later if there's any questions. Um, so, the kind of first tool I'm talking about is horizon scanning. So this is a document. It's pretty simple in its form. It could literally be done in an Excel spreadsheet, but it's a very organized way of uh, documenting trends and ensures a healthy ability for sense making. And so what that means is if, you know, on a given day, you're taking in anywhere from three to five different articles, different things you've read, and really extracting that insight, you're, this becomes kind of its home that you put it in. And over time, you start to really accumulate this body of knowledge about what's happening in the field. 
I, I think what this also changes is just a bit more of our awareness is that we start to just notice and have reason to kind of deep dive and like collect in interesting stimulating pieces of information. So I'm a big fan of this tool. Um, insights, it's, you know, this is not an exclusive thing to foresight. I think all designers work in insights, but to really make foresight effective in an organization, you have to, be, you have to really be able to communicate the, the takeaways that you're seeing. So insights become really the vehicle of basically transmitting the message um, that you have as a foresight practitioner to the broader part of the company. Um, so that ensures that the key takeaways from trends are, uh, that you share are relevant to your team. And I think actually this is a part that can get underscoped or underdeveloped. That can be a little bit of a bottleneck for foresight to kind of get pushed further. Next, we have the cross impact analysis. So this is a way to really kind of prioritize the trends that matter most to you. So what we do in, in with the horizon scanning document, you can add a weight to it. So you can say, you know, I think this has high impact or I think this has a high probability of happening. And you can take your top 25 um, trends and you put them on two different axes. So you have the same list of 25 on the vertical, same list of 25 on the um, horizontal, and you go one by one and you imagine each trend intersecting and you weight it. And this forms an analysis. And what you're weighting is um, really what's the impact that these two trends can have um, based on the focal issue that you're talking about. Um, and this becomes a really helpful way to really narrow down the, the trends that you want to do an analysis on. So this then gets into a two by two matrix and you probably have seen, you know, a, looks like a square where there's two lines that come across. This is a matrix that helps compare two different trends that creates four possible outcomes. This provides mental scaffolding to imagine new insights and possibilities. And what it's doing is it's creating a foundation to contrast topics that you wouldn't normally be able to imagine on your own. It, it becomes really a useful kind of jumping off tool. Um, and then this, this, the next step comes into is world building. So with these two trends that you're looking at, we now can actually imagine this future world that um, uh, these, this kind of access allowed to create. Um, and world building, what, what its job is to really do is to help bring that world to life. So help understand who are the people in this world? What are their behaviors? What does our built environment look like? What are popular sayings and culture? What do we value? Um, kind of gets a little bit into science fiction. I mean, you're not like trying to tell a huge story, but it's more of like, what's the background of a science fiction plot? And sometimes you're, you know, your curiosity can want to really understand the intricacies of how something's going to get done. You can almost imagine like doing service design kind of designs within, uh, within one of these worlds that I think would be very, very stimulating. Um, and within worlds, you can also then converge on something called an artifact of the future. Um, so this is a neat exercise. Um, Stuart Candy out of um, Carnegie Mellon, he's who put this on the map for me. Um, this is where it's basically a distillation of a moment in the future world. It could be a PSA, it could be a sign, it could be a new traffic law. Uh, I've seen where a sign that says, um, be careful, there are human drivers. You know, this would be a, a very simple way of communicating, oh, that's in the future and there's autonomous vehicles and wow, that's, it's so prolific that you have to warn about humans driving. And I think designers can really latch in to the art of making really compelling artifacts of the future. And these are really great in a corporate setting because they're, they're simple in a way. They're very clear and you can understand them very fast. Next, we move into scenarios. Um, scenarios are actually a bit different than world building. That was a question we got in the form. Um, so scenarios are, are a bit more intentional about exploring a particular um, what if. Um, mostly you'll see scenarios um, come in a package of three to four different scenarios where it's saying, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, but there could be three or four different potential outcomes. But you need to take a real stake in the ground of what that what if could be. And where the real work comes is doing implications analysis. So that's when you, you understand what this future can be. Um, and what you're going to do now is you're going to actually start to dissect a bit and really understand uh, what would be the implications on our future reality. And, and so what that means is it's a lot more of an analytical tool 
and you're going to come away with like clear, tangible insights that can be shared out with a broader team. Companies will then wind tunnel their strategy through scenarios to be able to see how is our company going to survive in this future and where is it going to reveal we have vulnerabilities and where should we put more effort to help create more resilience. Um, so I would say to kind of compare the two world building is a lot more on the creative kind of side where scenarios is a little bit more on the analytical side. They, they relate to each other in that way, but they have a bit of a different different purpose. Um, backcasting. This is a really fun tool to use. So, you know, now that we're in this future and we've kind of speculated something, maybe we've come up with an amazing service design or a new experience, um, but we've slated this for like 2027. What backcasting forces you to do is it, it makes you come back from your ideal state and reason the logic of how, how would we get here? So if let's say, you know, you love autonomous vehicles and you want to really imagine future products with them, you literally will take an event in 2027 and start imagining, okay, well in 2025, there must have been some new law that was passed that allowed for mass manufacturing. In 2023, you know, we saw a radical decline in um, drivership uh, with, uh, you know, regular or current types of cars. And you basically come up and tell a story of how this plausible future that you've just created um, has some logic to it. And I think this can be quite a rich exercise to, um, to do. And we've actually been exper experimenting this more with work. Um, and the last tool I'll describe today is causal layered analysis. This is a little bit more academic. Um, this is a four part deconstruction of the layers of a complex problem. This is developed by an amazing futurist out of Australia named Sohail Inayatola. Um, so he'll break down a topic from its kind of high level talking points, like what the news might understand a topic to be, then gets into the worldview, um, understands a little bit more of how people are perceiving that problem, gets into the deeper systemic drivers of what creates that problem, all the way down to the myth that people have towards that problem of why we might be doing a per particular thing. Um, we got to do work on this type of method in a workshop at South by Southwest at the uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors. And it was pretty great to see how politicians were actually able to sink into the deeper layers of a problem rather than just wanting to stay on the top layer. So I know that was a lot of the foresight tools and I think in a different context I can, you know, create a little bit more instructionals on more examples for them. but. And to give an overview there. So where, where, can you, where can you study foresight in these tools? So there's professional certificates that you can get um, while working. Um, Kedge is kind of the go-to place that I would recommend. It's run by Yvette, um, Yvette and Frank. Um, uh, and they basically are now putting it all online um, in response to the virus. So they normally do the global events all around the world. Now you can do a two, three day course and get trained in actually going through those different tools I just mentioned in detail. Um, so you can leave that workshop feeling like you really understand how to not only um, practice in them yourselves, but potentially teach other people. Uh, Rohrbach and Hager, they're a strategy firm out in Berlin. Um, they're incredible. Um, they uh, have created a, an argument to explain how companies that have foresight have 30% ROI in, in, their, in their return. Um, so they're really making the business case for foresight and they have a training on kind of a little bit more in the corporate sector of how to apply it. Uh, Sohail Anatola has a program with MetaFutures and then Institute for the Future is a great resource. Generally they have, um, I think they have mostly free, they free online resources. And this is a little snapshot, there are more. Um, but there, you know, some companies will invest in professional certificates, and I think that could be a great path. There's also a handful of graduate schools that focus on um, foresight. So the, there's a political science angle at University of Hawaii. They, they have an incredible program. University of Houston is really kind of leading the charge on helping kind of executive teams really think about the future. Uh, CCA, which is my alumni, or I'm an alumni of, uh, integrated their program with design strategy. So we are a little bit more in the design future space. So it's a bit more of the creative side. So how can like innovation help launch futures thinking uh, and future ideas? And then OCAD has, uh, I believe it's a MS in design, 
Um, so it's a little less on the business side, but um, also focused on the creative elements of Foresight. Um, and I actually work with a couple people from the OCAD program um, at, my job, at my job now. Um, so I just wanted to touch quickly on how Foresight practitioners and strategic designers are using these tools to react to COVID. Um, there's some really incredible uh, free resources that people are putting in line that I think is amazing. Um, so I want to highlight Leah Zadi um, from Multiverse Design. She's put out um, scenarios for COVID-19 that are accessible by free download. Um, I've gone through these. I think they're excellent and they really help elevate your thinking about possibilities for futures with, this, with, the, with the pandemic. Um, I think these serve as a really great starting point to do if you're more interested in design work because what it will allow for is it lays a foundation out to see what these possible futures are and then you do the work to do the implications. You think through what, what does this mean, what can happen and then you almost can apply a design thinking lens of, okay, what of these you know, implications is a problem that I feel compelled and have a reason to be solving for and can actually start now shifting a more proactive design thinking practice. Um, so I think that's very, very exciting. Um, and I think that's a great, very generous offer that she did that. Avenir Foresight Consulting also did something similar where they didn't put scenarios out, but they put out a series of implications and how might we uh, I think they're very thoughtful. Um, I've gone through them. There's like 150 different examples. And then um, the Journal of Future Studies is um, currently freely accessible right now. And I think Sohail has four excellent futures um, that I think are pretty robust and messy, which is, you know, a little bit of corporate speak around just feeling very different potential futures. Um, I also think these are a great overlay to do implications work on. I think there is one note to make that we should, should be just kind of a little sensitive and thought, you know, just kind of mindful that there's some heaviness when we actually look at this futures work with the pandemic because of potentially just the amount of loss that we're facing and how it can be really affecting a lot of different people. So while I do think there is a lot of rigor in this work that's super important, I also think we need to make sure we do not turn our emotional side off with this work because it can be, it can be intense because you might have to imagine a collapse state and that can require having to go into uncomfortable levels of thinking about things we don't want to happen. But um, I think what you develop over time is this kind of more opportunity lens on how can we reframe that. And I think that's where I know I personally get some empowerment um, from being able to do use these tools that way. Um, so just quickly hit these. This is the benefits of scenarios. Scenarios are, are built to promote thinking and stimulate conversations um, to ideate and design thinking terms. I've heard these described as thought trials or thought balloons that work in the same way that design prototypes. Um, <clears throat> these thought trials invoke a set of conjectures about a given problem. So they invite speculation, feedback, and learning. And so they answer questions like what problems will users or societies as a whole face and how many of these might be resolved and what new opportunities might there be and, and how might we react and um, try to solve for these opportunities. I recommend anyone who's wanting to kind of get into this space just to try your hand at working with scenarios. Just see what it's like. See how you react to them. See what part of it clicks to you where you get inspiration. See what part you don't like and feels really flat or just doesn't make sense. Um, but I think there's uh, a way to make them your own um, and also just help you just be able to process through the future yourself. So just a quick kind of overview on just how I am practicing foresight. I think this is kind of a little bit of the big reveal is that it's still pretty hard to do it. So I have, as I said before, I have like three different roles at work. Um, if I'm actually going from in terms of the, the roles I do the most, I would say UX design is actually my main job. I'm spending about 60% of my time uh, you know, on, on UX design. And sometimes that, I feel like it's actually been more like 70, 80% lately. Um, and that's where I'm doing things that are a bit more typical within the UX design space. So I'm doing research, I'm doing ideation, concept testing. Um, I'm focused on uh, computer vision. That's kind of in the, the space I've been working on at work, which is a type of visual AI. Um, so that's where there's a little bit of future elements because it's an emerging technology. 
Um, but mostly it's, it's still pretty grounded and, and practical agile based work style. 30% of my time is around strategic design. So this is where we go through the, basically it's innovation strategy. So we identify frictions, we create business models to solve for those frictions, can develop the concepts up and, and get to prototype them. And this usually ends with a pitch where we, we pitch this to a series of investors who might want to invest in these ideas. And then only really about 10% of my time is, is dedicated to foresight. Um, but I am trying very hard to increase that number. And so in my uh, magic hour, I've, uh, I work with a series of different people. We've been working on really creating new workshops. Um, and these workshops are incorporating trends, they cre cre incorporate scenarios, and they're really trying to leverage uncertainty to drive innovation so that we're more anticipatory. Um, and without, without these types of workshops, I've learned firsthand just how hard it is to get people to think in this level. So this is where that mental scaffolding point, I think really comes true in my opinion, where you really need a set of steps to bring people through to help elevate that kind of thinking. I think this has been a critical point that I've learned over time is just there's a, you need to choose an approach um, and how you're gonna specialize. So there's two angles. You can be a content futurist versus a process futurist. So a content futurist is gonna specialize and have a deep expertise on a particular subject. They'll know the dominant trends, recent weak signals, potential wild cards, and will have insight into second and third order implications that are really meaningful. Uh, and so when you're a content futurist, you will likely show up in a workshop to really espouse like knowledge on that subject. Um, so that's one style of being a futurist. The other is being a process futurist where your the specialty is is in the steps taken to create a foresight process. So you'll have a deep knowledge and mastery of the tools and you'll know how to customize those tools for client needs. Um, so I would currently identify way more in the process futurist side because that's where with the time I do have a lot of to foresight, I can do a deep dive into. I would say I have maybe some of my own personal topics that I'm interested on the content level but there's kind of a barrier before I would try to bring that into a professional space and say, I'm truly an expert on this topic. I think there's some kind of, uh, you know, trials you have to go through to kind of get to that level. Um, but this, this framework has really helped me actually know uh, what I should, like it's helped me know how to feel okay if I don't know something, if that makes sense. There's been times where I feel like I've been expected to be the content futurist and it's like, that, that's just not what I'm, that's not my training. That's not, not what I'm here to do. I'm here to teach, teach about process. Okay. Um, and kind of my, my closing point here is that futurists are really all different. Um, whatever your background or training in, it will act like kind of like a prism in which you'll see the future. Um, and I think that's a really special and kind of, you know, beautiful part of this work is that there's a lot of diversity in the thinking, even with a shared language. So with my background in architecture and sociology, um, I'm really drawn to the tension between the digital and the physical world. Um, and so I want to explore more just ways for us to live together on the planet. And I think that feels kind of important these days. Um, and I feel like, you know, in the futures that I'm personally curious about is really understanding how the digital and the physical can really help create that type of, of balance and, and harmony. And so that, that's kind of it. That's our, that's my, um, the foresight primer. Um, so love to open this up to any questions and comments. And as an aside, if you know, anything I talked about today is interesting to you and you would wanna follow up, I'm super happy to connect uh, and have contact information below. Um, great, so maybe Ronnie, I'll, I'll uh, turn it to you and we can moderate any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Dave. That was an incredibly, informative session. You packed a lot in there um, and I think probably answered a lot of questions that people have had for a long time. I really appreciate how you overlaid strategic foresight onto that larger map and talked about how it's been a little bit hidden because I think that that's, you know, the experience that a lot of people have had. We hear about it, but we don't really know what it means necessarily or even uh, what the language is, how people talk about it, you know, sort of, I think you spoke a lot to the business context for this kind of practice, which unless you work in a consultancy or in a business where these kinds of things are really thought about, it can be very hard to access and 
really know what are the kinds of conversations that are happening. Um, so I think you've been yeah. super generous in sharing that, you. you know, a little window into that. Um, and so we did get a lot of questions that were sent in advance, but I want to give an opportunity for everyone here to also ask questions. If you have anything that you've been, you know, holding on to as um, Dave was speaking, and if you could just pop it into the chat window, that would be great. Um, and then we can we can uh, we can go through those. Um, so while people are formulating their questions and putting it in there. Uh, one of the questions I want to start with, a lot of people had, were really wondering, Dave, <laughs> how is it that you can start to sell in these kinds of practices in terms of value and really make it a more professionalized practice? You know, so I think we've seen a lot of this work happening, you know, as we said, either deep in consultancies, very high up in organizations, um, or as an academic practice, right? And so it hasn't really become a part of the, you know, the sort of even like dominant strategy and design, you know, lingo or, or conversations. So can you speak to that a little bit in terms of your experience with that? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, so this has been a huge question I've had myself that I've been trying to understand well. Um, I think the you know, the, the business side of this is kind of key to make this sustainable and come from an entrepreneurial design background. So I understand the need to really define value for the work we're creating. What, what I've kind of learned with this work is that it, it really does involve high up leaders, you know, so the people who are going to be able to make decisions on the future tend to be more senior people in the organization. So you deal with just kind of the bureaucracy of getting access to them and also having to deal with the expectations they have in terms of the amount of certainty they want in the type of work that you're going to do. Um, so I think sometimes what can be hap that can be challenging is getting opportunities to even practice, to even get that initial pitch, to even just do the work, to see, like, to figure it out with, with a client or with, you know, with a team. Um, because you can be, you know, as abstract and is, you know, develop, you can do as much development work in a schematic level as possible, but there's so much of this work that centers on how people are going to understand the material. And I think that takes practice and really understanding uh, culture and or culture. So I think what I would recommend is two things. I'd re recommend really understanding um, how your organizational culture works or how um, the a, a company that you want to pitch these tools already works and understand the way that their project management cycle operates in. So um, what that might mean is like they might want something within a very tight frame, you know, so like really starting point is think about your project management structure. So what are all your steps? What are what are going to be your key deliverables? Is it going to be a workshop? Is it going to be a set of scenarios? You have to get ex very, very crystal clear on that. Um, and then the second part is when it comes to figuring out your value, I think it's, it doesn't have to be too mysterious. I think it can be simply like understand what your hourly rate is and understand how much time it takes you to do this work. And I think there's some, you know, kind of back and forth you have to learn through this process of what's the kind of expected amount of time clients would, um, you know, really want to pay you to do this type of work. Like where's their uh, kind of willingness to pay is the, I guess, the language I would use. But I, I would say, you know, it's, um, there is actually increasing demand for this work. I see it within my organization that teams around different parts of our offices around the world, they want more access to this. And they're seeing that clients are willing to pay decent money for, for these workshops. Um, so I think the, the value is there. I think the tools are here. I think we're just at this funny stage of now just needing to spread it. We want to just spread the message as much as we can. And then I think get really good at codifying your steps and processes. So I would say at this point, I've had to be at a point where I can tell you within three weeks, essentially exactly what I can do to be able to launch a foresight workshop. And I think that's how I would be able to get kind of signed on for, for a project. I have one quick follow-up question and then there's lots of questions that um, people are asking now. So just as a quick follow-up, where have you seen the most success when you put these ideas forward I'm curious, like what kinds of clients tend to be more open or interested in engaging with this 
you know, what are the conditions where you have found it's been more, uh, where you've had the most success? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, it's easy to want to say it's only the really cutting edge companies that do want this, but it's actually not true. I'm, we're finding uh, companies in the industrial goods space, the automotive space, um, companies I've never heard of before <laughs> that frankly are interested in this because they want to, they see the competitive advantage that comes from it. Um, they'll center it though on new product development. I think that's going to be the big key. So help have your workshop help figure out what could be new opportunities that could come in out of it as a result. So are you designing a new product? Are you going to design a new experience, a new service, a new company, a new partnership, a new strategy? Have some clarity on the type of end output that you're aiming towards. Um, that will really help the conversation. But there, there will be interest in that because um, so many companies, large companies, talking Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies, they constantly need to make new products. They, they need new, new ideas to circulate through their organizations. Um, and Frank, you know, due to the kind of VUCA world I was describing before, I think a lot of companies are trying to really figure out what, what does the market want right now? What is the right opportunity? So I think there's even more interest in trying to be able to tackle that and, and ground that. And I think that's where these uh, futures workshops can be very applicable. That's great. Thank you. Um, so Matt had a question. Matt, do you just want to uh, pop on uh, and ask, go ahead and ask the question? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me fine? Yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Dave. This has been really, really insightful. Um, my background is in ethnographic research, and you mentioned that kind of in your upfront. And I was curious if you have any thoughts or examples of how those two practices of ethno ethnographic research and futures practice can influence each other or inform each other. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I would say that's probably still a bit on the fringe in terms of like being really codified tools. I, I, I mean, I definitely think there are some practitioners who are doing that. Wouldn't say I've seen it too popularized yet in the organization, but it seems like such a great intersection of um, tools. Um, I believe Stuart Candy and Kelly Cornett have um, something called experiential um, ethnographic futures um, where they're diving deeper into the way that people are going to feel in the future. And so I think that it's, I, I need to double check, Travis might know more on this one, but um, just around the idea of kind of probing at um, speculations on the future and how people will react on them. So that could be like where the interviews and ethno, ethnographic research really centers on is, is probing like kind of an understanding of um, how one and how would people react to maybe a scenario and two, also, the topic is of an uh, image of the future. What's some of their subconscious understanding of the way the world's going to go? Um, that's a pretty rich topic, and um, Jake Dunnigan speaks a lot on image of the future. That could be a really interesting thing to maybe dive deeper into. Awesome. And could you quickly just remind me those two names you mentioned earlier? Uh, yeah. So um, Stuart Candy is um, out of Carnegie Mellon, and then Kelly Cornett. Um, I think she's uh, at Calypso. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, Elizabeth Cook, I think you had a question as well. Do you want to pop on? Hi. Can you guys see me? Yeah. Okay. So um, when you talk about that intervention to prevent dangerous behavior in South Korea, I was really intrigued because Thus far, it seems like everything we've been given to make us more social has been ultimately bad for us and bad for who we are and bad for our souls. So I just wanted to know more about how this structure of thinking is hoping to actually be pro-social instead of promising pro-social and creating like anti-social behaviors. Well, I think you're hitting the kind of million dollar kind of gray area there. Um, I think, yeah, I think with, with a lot of where tech's going, you know, there's kind of the intersection of, um, you know, figuring out meaningful use cases that drive value for business, but then also leveraging emerging technologies. And um, what we learned within the health and safety space within steel factories is that um, there's just been a plateau in terms of the way that health and safety has been improving. Um, so this solution was designed to intend to create more safety with workers. Um, but on, if I'm totally honest, it was, it was a hard process. It was, it was a process that took over a year. And there are many points along that route where 
it could go into an authoritarian big brother surveillance. We, we got very fortunate on this project that we had a corporate partner we were working with that really cared about their workers and their, the values um, that they had. Um, so we basically co-designed the product with the workers. And so we had multiple co-creation sessions and really wanted the workers input to say like, okay, what you understand the problem we're trying to solve. What do you think will be the most effective solution? Um, it actually had to go all the way with into the unions because the unions weren't convinced that what we were doing was as sincere as maybe it would look. And um, so the unions, the, the union rep actually came into our workshops and, um, and was participating in it. And I think that really helped because it, it helped us all align on what's really, you know, kind of a safe space for us to play in that is, is going to net out. It's, it's going to be for, for the good. I, I believe there needs to be probably another layer um, with this type of work to really ensure kind of a longevity of that kind of what I would maybe describe as ethical behavior. And I think emerging technologies are complex in that they're obscure. I don't always think that they're actually so hard to understand when you can see into the hood, but when you don't get access to that information, they can feel very, um, you know, scary, to be honest. So I have an opinion that with some of these emerging technologies, transparency is key. Um, and as much transparency as you can um, have with on a design team or an engineering team, I think that can really help uh, shape the conversation with how the product works in market. Um, but I think to just the last point you said around, you know, that pro-social, I think this is going to be, uh, I think this is going to be a conversation that the design community is also going to have to keep accountability on pretty much the whole kind of tech ecosystem. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, okay, we just have a couple more questions here. Jordan, are you still on? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Oh, great. Hi, Jordan. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, hi, Dave. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my question, I guess, was just about uh, kind of connecting two things that I heard and kind of provoked the thought just around collapse. And so you mentioned, and I, I mean, I can relate and understand how difficult collapse conversations are to have uh, with clients. Um, but the shell example um, makes the collapse scenario sound like the most valuable or the most useful and um, and so I just wonder that kind of introduces a bit of a paradox or uh, a bit of a sticky spot to be in where that's the conversation that, you know, you should have, or those are the scenarios you should be considering, um, I presume, in, 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 as part of these conversations. But it's but they're the hardest conversations to have, and they're not as fun as talking about preferred futures. So I just wondered, you know, with your 10% time, <laughs> what, uh, how, how you've, if and how you, you maybe have dealt with that, I, I guess it's just like, how do you have the the serious kind of downer conversation when it's much more fun to prototype something that's going to make everybody rich, you know? Yeah. I, I, that's a really, I think, wise question. Um, I think like what you're getting at is probably really the advanced level of, of this kind of work. I think where Pierre Walk was at was pretty, pretty sophisticated um, in that I think it requires a ton of trust um, to be able to get to the level where you could talk about a collapse scenario. Um, because there actually will be, I think, a lot of an emotional reaction. And I think that can be difficult to work with, but I think it's, it, it's also kind of critical and essential to work with because I think we actually get a lot of insight into decision making when we can access that. Um, so within, the, within my context, I'm, I'm not really having collapse scenario conversations. I don't think we're in a consulting model. It, it's really at the point yet where we have that kind of trust with, with uh, organizations. Um, I also think we, this could be something we kind of work towards and aspire towards where if we get really good at running these workshops, we can maybe like understand the right way to kind of introduce these workshops to that audience. Uh, but admittedly, I think we're still in a little bit more of a elementary state that we're not fully there um, for kind of a paid context. I'll add one other point in that um, I just shared this kind of framework with a nonprofit whose, whose specialty is in um, climate um, change um, strategy for Cal California state government. And they had a really kind of like intense reaction to collapse state. It was very traumatizing. I mean, they're looking at 
transportation and they do trans transportation advocacy and there's actually speculations that our transit systems in California will shut down and they won't reopen. So um, that was a, one of my first real interactions with that type of emotion from a, a collapse scenario. Um, that was like, okay, this is actually pretty hard to navigate. And I think you would wanna go into this like almost delicate and, and really come in with the right set of resources um, to help. But to your point, I think why Shell was able to avoid those crises is because they did have those conversations. So I think it's almost like that paradox is kind of the, the thing we have to kind of drive towards, but I think it's gonna be where, it's gonna be a little bit more of a collective effort. I think we need a broader community to be able to really um, get to that stage. Yeah, I just, had, I just had a thought as you were talking about just sort of the dynamic in the room. So there's a, maybe some of you have come across a school out in uh, Sweden called Hyper Island, but um, I was in an activity that they did once about, and, and it's in, they've published about, it. I think it's other folks use it too, but this notion of stinky fish. But they, did, they have people talk about like their deepest kind of darkest fear as a way of opening up uh, the, the workshop and sort of sets a real tone of vulnerability but you can also see how maybe you're not describing the collapse scenario, but it actually starts to, it could, it could come up kind of emergent from within the room. Um, so I don't know. Anyways, there's, there's probably lots of ways to attack it. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great example. Yeah. So I think it's yeah. going to get a little bit into culture. Um, so some of the corporates can be a little uncomfortable with that, but I think the right there are plenty of other smaller businesses or other types of organizations that I think have a little bit more uh, confidence going into that type of space. But that's a, that sounds like a great tool. Thanks, Jordan. Um, so I want to ask a I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to combine a few different ones that people have, um, just because we're getting towards the end end of this. And then if I haven't, if uh, Dave hasn't answered your question, feel free to pop on and and sort of add you know add a follow up. There's a lot of questions around, I think as a follow up to what Jordan was saying as well, just questions around how you resolve different kinds of views of futures, whether it's preferred or it's collapsed or it is reality versus what the company wants to hear perhaps, or you know the kinds of futures that they're, that they're interested in seeing mm -hmm. um, develop. And so can you speak to that tension um, and I'm just gonna add on to that. And also this question about trust, right? And so there's trust about what happens in a, <clears throat> excuse me, in a post COVID world. Um, but I think there's also, an, there's a question around trust in, um, in these potential futures and how much you can rely and or um, understand or extrapolate, you know, from, from these futures that are being designed and developed. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really great point. I think like, so the way I would tease it out is um, the kind of collapse scenarios, that's a, like, we could call that, that's a, a spoke of um, Jim Dater's alternative futures where he looks at growth, collapse, uh, discipline and, and transform. Those are kind of speculations on the entire world, like the way that kind of major, major macro forces will look. So when you then center the futures work on a company, you can help them understand what's their preferred future with these taking into account these scenarios within these different worlds. Um, so that's where the preferred future language is actually helpful, looking through a collapse, looking through discipline, looking through growth or looking through transform is because now you can actually see um, what will be the most resilient way your organization can function uh, in spite of all these potential things that can happen outside of your control. Um, so I would say that the, I would center the preferred future a bit more on the organization, whereas the collapse would be more general to the world. Um, the other side is like what the company wants to hear. I think we kind of call that baseline futures. So that's kind of like the, the business as usual. Like we just kind of stay the course. Um, that's actually kind of a tool that um, Andy Hines uses to say like, that's a starting point. You can almost just start with like the presumed future. And then you, you, know, you get alignment there and kind of, it can be um, quite stimulating. If you get alignment, there's even a little bit of excitement on the base future. And then you just show how actually vulnerable it is. You know, that's where uh, the, you know, the same scenarios I just described with um, the four different versions 
can actually reveal why that business as usual future is actually not as maybe sturdy as they might think. And there's probably people in the room who are aware of it, they can see the vulnerabilities, but they might interact with some kind of closed mindedness. Um, so I think it, it kind of just requires a little bit of um, kind of teasing out what you're, where you're centering the kind of future logic on uh, the organization or on the kind of future worlds you're creating for them. I think that makes a lot of sense. This idea of resilience is so important right now too. Yeah. Um, Travis, I think you had a question as well. <laughs> Travis, what's your question? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. <laughs> no, let's, I see a long paragraph. Let's go. Yeah, I'll more or less read it because I was careful about my word choice here. Um, but really, you talked a bit about the importance of understanding systems deeply and like cross impact analysis. Um, in order to create really robust scenarios. But of course, you also mentioned that you only have about 10% of your time that you can focus on the pure foresight work. So I'm wondering if you have any tips about how to go about getting familiar enough with complex systems, right? If you're put on a project um, or even if it's just an area of interest um, in order to be able to create futures that are both credible and provocative to a biased audience. Well, that's a good question. Um, yeah. So I think my what we what I would say we've learned going down this path with with our ten percent is that we don't have the bandwidth to create our own scenarios. Um, so there's a lot of scenarios that are actually available, you know, and they're published and they're kind of democratized. Um, and so we can leverage um, existing scenarios. We're a little bit kind of unique in that we have people in our organization who are writing scenarios, so we can actually leverage internal work. Um, but there, there is so much work that's being put out that's free or that's in books or in journal articles that I think that could always be at least a starting point. And I think you can start practicing kind of your ability to analyze complex systems through that effort. Um, and then there are techniques and steps that are, um, you know, uh, addressed to, to how to make custom scenarios. It's a bit of an involved process. But if you want to spend your nights and weekends, <laughs> like being a bit of a dork like I've been and trying to understand this process, um, that is also a pathway forward. It's just a little time consuming. Um, you know, it's not always super fun, but what, what's pretty exciting is when it does finally click, um, is that when you start to actually understand how all these tools come together. Um, but I, I would really, again, leverage on um, free resources because there is a lot of stuff out there that we can be taking advantage of um and then maybe finding other like-minded people to connect with to actually get to talk through your analysis um, and maybe the last point i would say is i think implication work is one of the keys for being good at this i think that's where you start to see the range of quality so i would also recommend just practicing developing that second and third order implication analysis from the scenario um, and that could be a way uh, we ensure some of more of the credibility and the, the pro provocative nature of it. Thanks. And I feel like you know a lot of this, Strat. I think you, uh, you're, you're familiar with this. Travis, we might have to have you on sometime. <laughs> Give good. your take on all of this. I'd, I'd uh, be happy to. So we have arrived right at our, uh, almost at our bewitching hour. Um, does anyone have any last minute thoughts or not last minute, but just last thoughts or questions that you wanna ask? Um, I feel like that was, those are really great questions. Uh, and thank you for putting them out there. And Dave, your responses were super insightful. Um, if not, then I just want to make a couple of quick announcements before everyone heads out. We are going to post this on Vimeo. So if you want to go back and uh, just check out some of the points that Dave was making or some look at some of the references he had, we'll have it up on Vimeo probably in the next week or so. Um, we, this is the beginning of a series, and so we're going to bring on more practitioners every few weeks, and I think it'll be a very similar model, um, kind of like a, uh, a little, you know, 
presentation Q&A session. And we'll have practitioners from across many different fields. So we'll bring some world builders. We'll bring people who are working more um, in terms of the artifact creation. Um, that was a really nice survey that you had, Dave, in terms of the different kinds of practices. And so if you have any, any individuals or types of practices that you're super interested in learning more about, definitely send us an email and let us know. Um, we'll do our best to try to get somebody, uh, either that person or somebody who can speak to those, um, to those methodologies. And at certain points, we might start to introduce some workshops as well so that you can do more hands-on, you know, just trying some of these um, approaches that, that are being raised. Um, and that's really all of the announcements that I had. I also just wanted to let you know that there is a Slack channel. Like I mentioned earlier, um, there is a LA, a Speculative Futures LA Slack channel, but there's also a larger one, which is the Global um, Speculative Futures Group. And there's, I think, a, almost a thousand people that are on that channel. So if you're, you know, interested and curious to meet other people beyond the LA chapter, it's a really fantastic place to, um, to go. And I will, how do I make that available? Maybe you could just email me or email the spec, Speculative Futures LA um, email and just let, let us know that you're interested and I can add you to that. Um, Cause our LA one is not that active. I don't know if anyone's checked it <laughs> in the last few. There's like seven <laughs> messages on there. Um, but the global one is super active. So I just wanted to make sure you guys knew about that. And so that brings us to the end of the session. Thank you so much again, Dave. Really appreciate all of the, all of the thoughts and time that you put into sharing that with us. My pleasure. This was, I, re I really appreciate um, being able to share it. And thanks for all the uh, super insightful, great questions uh, from the audience. All right, everyone have a good evening. It was great to see you. We hope to see you at the next, at the next gathering. Great. Good night. Thank you. Yeah, bye. Good night. Bye guys. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Oh, and uh, Tatiana, I think you had a question. I'm happy to uh, follow up with you on that. Oh, one. sorry, Tatiana. I thought that maybe I had kind of incorporated that question, but if uh, if not, yeah. It was well incorporated with another question from maybe Saurabh. Yeah, I think that was a good combination. Okay. We're good. <laughs> yeah, the million dollar question of how do we actually get to talk about futures without it just being about profit? Because <laughs> I yeah. think we, we might need to start doing this work to like survive. <laughs> you know, how do, how, do, how do we, you know, ensure humanity lives on earth? Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, you know, a higher motive. I think it's a really great question. I think it's, um, I think it really depends on the organization. And this is where I'm hoping that more purpose-driven organizations get more power and more influence and more money, to be honest, so that they can help really set the conversation. Um, I personally would love to see a future where we have new metrics that challenge profit as the dominant KPI. Um, I think that's, you know, some could say that's maybe a little, you know, idealistic, but in terms of the way how fast everything's changing, I think there could actually be an argument to be made that we could be actually closer to that than we think. Um, so in that case, I think it would be grounding um, new KPIs is like, what's our, what's really our North star for the organization that we could be aspiring to. Um, one, one thing is I know in um, the finance world, ESG is becoming a really interesting framework. It stands for environmental, social, and governance. Uh, so basically they're trying to only create portfolios with companies that are performing well in those spaces. Uh, there's still a little bit of a profit angle, but at, there's some um, at least acknowledgement of other KPIs that corporations are, should be held accountable for. Um, so yeah, so it's my, this would be my kind of my dream is to help, you know, figure out how can companies, you know, think beyond just profit as, as a, as a goal that they're striving towards. We're answering that. <laughs> yeah, no problem. it's a good, yeah, it's a big question. Great. Well, thanks everyone. And, uh, yeah, let me, happy to follow up. I, if you can't tell, I, I really like this topic, so <laughs> happy to chat more about stuff. Uh, and Tatiana, did I say that you're an architect or have an architecture background? Yeah, I do. How does yeah. that show? <laughs>
Where did you read that? <laughs> I think I saw it somewhere. You put maybe, I think you posted a question about architecture. You asked about speculative work. It, uh, I'd be happy to follow up offline if you want to ever chat more about that. Wonderful. Cool. Okay. Bye, people. Bye, Travis. Bye, Vienna. Bye, Ronnie. Bye, Saram. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. <laughs> oh. oh. Bye. Vienna and Travis, we all got to connect. We got to talk. Yeah. Talking to Travis <laughs> tomorrow. Talking tomorrow. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Bye. Spread it. All right. Bye, everyone. See you. Bye.